immer, wenn ich hier morgens mit dem Bus lang. Whenever I took the bus this way in the morning, I always checked to see if anything was there. And now there's supposed to be something. So let's take a look. This just appeared last night. We just heard about it, so it was discovered today. And because the field is likely visible from the road, a lot of people have probably seen it. Sometimes you can't really see it if the ground isn't entirely flat. I actually used to come here with my tent and camp out on Barge Inn's campground where the croppies, as we call ourselves, used to meet. There it is. I see it. Yeah, there are quite a few people. Oh, okay, you, you need to turn around here. Wow, that's really something. Man, that's beautiful. That's incredible. <laughs> It's like a wall. It's really stiff. <laughs> like, like a river, like water flowing around. I prefer this. I got uh, a phone call this morning from Charles from the Science Circle Cafe telling me that this was here. And then I ring other people and they ring other people and in the end we all know about it. So your first impression? It looks good. I like it. I like it a lot. But you have to see it from the air. This is one of those things that you have to fly over and you have to absorb it while you actually go in the air and see it from high above. Your next steps? Is get a plane and fly. The exciting thing about crop circles for me has always been that they take a special place among the multitude of so-called paraphenomena, because they're not a subjective perception. They aren't a vision that's only seen by certain people or that can only be seen by certain people. They're not like some short-lived phenomena that fly away or disappear. A crop circle appears in a field and it's there. Nobody can stand there and say, I don't see it, it's not there. That that means everyone can visit and investigate it. Everyone can experience the crop circle for himself. It's a part of our reality. I've seen at least six to seven hundred crop circles myself. 
It's not like the first time anymore, but you can compare it with a crime scene investigation. It doesn't help the police if a hundred curious onlookers have already trampled all over it. These circles are standing upright all over the place. And here we have a place in the field where none of the grain is standing, but the grass is completely undisturbed. I would say that if someone stamps all over it in the middle of the night, they'd hardly distinguish between grain and normal grass. We've also had other cases where non-native plants are in the field and are left untouched. This shows that whatever affected this type of grain practically conforms to the resistance given by these plants. What do you do with all these photos? They are archived and some of them are geometrically evaluated. Diagrams are also made on the basis of aerial photos. Books and calendars are made, but that's essentially a side effect. It's primarily all about documentation. The fascination is very strongly connected with the aerial photos. If you take a look around you, you don't see much. Most of the images people have of crop circles are from the aerial photos. The most important question for crop circle research is whether there is a real phenomenon, meaning something not made by the hand of man. And we've come to the conclusion that yes, this is clearly a real phenomenon, and it can be proven. There is a whole range of indicators and hard evidence that satisfies even the most stringent scientific standards. We started testing crop circles all over the world. Uh, by now, I think, I would guess that at least 350, maybe if I haven't counted them, maybe it's 400, that we have sampled in eight different countries, eight or nine now, including Australia, Israel, uh, Canada, the United States, Germany, the Netherlands. We can prove that there is apparently a rotational force. This rotational force contains an energy component that works like a microwave. We can reproduce many of the changes which take place in the plants and soils by means of microwave radiation. The microwaves heating the moisture inside turns to steam, and as it does so, it has to escape. Well, if the plants are young and pliable, the outer fibers are pliable, the steam escapes by stretching the nodes. That's how you get the elongated nodes. If the energy is extremely intense and or if the crop is old and the fibers are tough, then it can't get out by stretching it because the fibers won't stretch or it's just too much energy. Then it blows a hole right out at the node. 
Stärke dieser Beschädigungen If we see it as a simple circle, the extent of the damage to the plants decreases as you go from the center to the edge. And that's exciting because we can in principle deliver the proof that we're dealing with electromagnetic radiation here. The so-called Beer-Lambert principle, the effect of electromagnetic radiation on matter. In this case, represented in plants. And we can see here that the changes in the points in the center are the strongest and they gradually decline outwards to the edge of the circle. And that is in any other scientific research clear evidence of the effect of electromagnetic radiation on matter. What we've discovered now in formation after formation all over the world are these tiny little rounded particles, but the fact that they're perfectly spherical indicates they were in a molten state because that's how you get the, the spheres. Right. And furthermore, we not only find them, we find them deposited in very unusual ways. Sometimes they're deposited at the edges of the circle only. Sometimes they're deposited very definitely in the middle. And even more interestingly, sometimes there's a linear deposition, meaning that you'll have perhaps the least at the center, a little bit more five feet out, a little bit more 10 feet out, until you get the most, the greatest amount at the edge, but in a clear linear progression. We have also found changes in the soils which we have analyzed. In the soil of the crop circle, there is a distinctly higher concentration of magnetic material compared to the control samples. And this material can also be shown to be distributed centrifugally from the center outwards. Additionally, we have analyzed the crystalline structures of the aluminium oxide minerals in various crop circles. It's well known that they expand under certain natural circumstances, and limiting ourselves only to the surface soil of the crop circles, we have found these crystalline structures changed in such a way that we could normally only explain it as a result of extremely high pressure. But you can rule this out because this type of pressure on the plants can't be proven. They weren't damaged and the temperatures that these plants would have had to have been exposed to would be so high that sustained exposure would have incinerated the field. It's an amazing fact. Uh, this kind of alteration in clay minerals is normally associated with sedimentary rock. When you have tons of the pressure of mountains pressing down on over hundreds of years on sedimentary rock. Uh, here we are in surface soil. I wasn't sure, but I didn't think this had ever been seen before in surface soil. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. At the 95% level, I was blown away. I thought, oh my God. So I said, you know, I don't believe you. <laughs> and so I had it done again. I hired somebody else. And we repeated the statistics because I just didn't, I couldn't believe it. Well, in fact, that's what we had. As best I can tell is that there are microwaves or something that's acting like microwaves. There is are electrical charges, which I think he's nailed down. And there are, there is strong magnetism, at least, at the very least, we have that going on. This means we can describe parts of the paintbrush or the pen, but we don't know who or what uses this brush to create these forms. In view of this modern phenomenon, we very clearly have a geometric evolution from simple individual circles to systematic orderings, groupings of multiple circles, ring systems, all the way to pictogram-like patterns which have become much larger and more complex. We can create the same geometry when we project tones onto the surface of standing water, as Alexander Lauterwasser does with his water sound images. Perfect patterns as though they were created by a compass arise, which we can see not only in very complex crop circles, but also in nature's diversity. 
Very clearly structured geometry emerges. Interestingly, this is the type of geometry we're talking about when a peacock displays his feathers and your eye connects the individual eyes with each other. That's why the question remains for me, is it possible that the same phenomena, the same stimuli that create a flower, the forces that ensure that the peacock's feathers conform to this proportional and aesthetic picture, also interact with what creates the crop circles. I mean, the shell of a, of a seashell, snowflakes, I mean, there are millions and millions of, of examples of nature creating incredibly intricate designs. Nature creates designs everywhere, all the time. There are also very complex crop circles that nevertheless take on nature's language of shape and form. For this reason, one could pose the theory that we're dealing with an as yet unknown natural phenomenon that possesses components that we don't understand. How are things whose geometrical equivalents are found in the diversity of shape and form of nature's bounty geometrically carried over into a field as a crop circle? We see this in crystalline structures, in the formation of a blossom or of a beehive, for example. So I can imagine that we have various sources of what we call the crop circle phenomenon. Somehow these shapes go deep inside us, talk to us, and not on a conscious life, it's not that we look at the shapes and think, oh, that's this, that's that, that's that. But on a subconscious level, the big question is, what are they doing there? And what are they supposed to do? Carl Gustav Jung, the great uh, psychologist of kind of psychiatrist, has done a lot of research in the influence of shapes on the human mind, and especially the uh, subconscious mind. And I see lots of connections between his work and what I see in the crop circles. So I think there's um, in the crop circles is, is something going on like subliminal messages that, that is used in uh, advertisements in a very bad way to try to maneuver people in uh, buying things that they actually don't want to buy. I think the crop circles do it in a very positive way in subliminal level talk to us, help us to make the next step in our evolution, our next necessary step we have to take. We experienced over the last years that uh, what people are thinking, that, that will be imprinted into the fields. Uh, we were discussing uh, the, the, the form of, uh, of the Malteser cross, for example. One day later, it was appearing in the field. We were discussing whether or not this could have something to do with earth magnetism. And in that very night, just behind our bed and breakfast uh, uh, dress, there appeared a huge formation uh, which, which was showing a, a magnetic field with two poles, a north and a south pole. The, the question, what crop circles try to point out to us is about at the same level as what is the meaning of life. It's, it's a very difficult question. A lot of people ask, why are we here? What are we doing here? What's the meaning of life? And there will be a true purpose. And somehow, seemingly, in my opinion, we need help to see that. We all want to know that. It's a strange thing that we have all this urge in our inner self to know from what are we doing here? What, where are we going? Are we going some way? And I think the crop circles help us to understand that, what our true purpose is, and assist us to actually get to that point. I came to Wiltshire 
And this was the very, very first crop circle I saw. The very first one I walked through. Now my background is mathematics. I study mathematics, so when I saw this, I thought, wow, I know this, because this is Pythagoras. The geometry that's behind the crop circles is exactly the geometry that you will use as a human when you would try to reconstruct them. So when you use a compass and a straight edge, but you're not measuring anything, you're just purely constructing, then you will see you can make these crop circles by pure construction <coughs> techniques. And the interesting thing is that when you do that, you will see that the crop circles have skipped certain steps. So in a way, they follow our mind, the human mind, because they use the same way as we would use geometry. But on the other hand, they skip little steps to tell actually if we want it, we don't need this. It's just to show you that we have a connection. There's something going on between you and us. And that's why we skip these steps, but on the other hand, we follow your way of thinking and your way of working. And I find that very intriguing. Now, it's clear that this points somewhere. Nobody can deny that this is some kind of error. And that triggered me. Where is this arrow pointing at? And I will show you where it's pointing at, at that spot there. That appeared exactly there. This is an illustration out of Alice in Wonderland, and that will show you that this doorway is something indicating about different worlds you can travel through, different dimensions. What was really the question is, this doorway again is pointing somewhere. Let's have a look. It's Sugar Hill. And what is on this spot where it's pointing at? Nothing until that one appeared. I'm convinced, and I've studied that as well, that the crop circles in itself are not separate events. They're not just separate, here's a crop circle, there's a crop circle, there's a crop circle. And when you look from higher up, from, from, from a bigger picture, you will see they're all connected. For you to discover from, look at the bigger picture, go over it, don't look at the detail, don't get lost in the little things, don't be on your knees, but try to get wings and fly over it and see the big picture. And to make it clear to us, it shows us that it's connected to geometry in the landscape. I think, again, to wake us up from just see the bigger picture. Just don't look at the little details, but see the bigger picture. And then you will see it's actually one. There's only one message there, one signal, one beep. This is a crop circle that appeared on the 1st of June 2008 near Barbary Castle. Because of the terraced spiral formation, it has a very clear relation to a crop circle near Barbary Castle in 1990. It really stands out in that it is divided into ten equal parts. First, we have in the first curve three layered segments, then only one is layered over the others. Then we have four, one, five, nine segments, two, six segments, five and four, and then we find a number we can read, and that is 3.14192654. Even with the decimal point in the right place. And if you are so inclined to read it this way, there are even three circles at the end which serve to emphasize the infinite nature of this number. In principle, when you see this, it is exactly what you could imagine when you think of how intelligent messages can be sent in the form of geometry. Very many of the crop circles go through this exercise of relating the length of the perimeter of a square to the precise circumference measurement of a circle. This is squaring the circle. The interpretation of pi is another matter but let us establish the basis that is saying pi. Can't argue it. 
Now, you know my interpretation. My interpretation would be that pi is the key to a mediation between the square material world and the circular world of spirit. The square, traditionally, in many cultures, represents the earth. Solid stuff. And the circle represents heaven, God, the divine. And the problem has always been how to bring the earth nearer to heaven, or how to bring the square nearer the circle. Simple as that. I think I can safely say that people can't do this. Human beings cannot continue every year to produce completely new themes of design. I mean, it takes my breath away. The night this formation came down, um, it was windy. This is a high altitude location. This takes a battering by the weather. Um, so anyway, we were within, we were with two other researchers, we were the first little group of people to come in here. No footprints, no mud, no bad, you know, no broken plants, all the centers were perfect. No, no, no sign of human activity or entry into this field. It seemed almost impossible that that could be the work of, you know, a few humans going out and smashing the plants down with pieces of wood. It just seemed far too sophisticated, far too perfect. You know, some of these designs, you know, you couldn't draw them out on a piece of paper freehand or with a, with a desk lamp, let alone, you know, a thousand feet wide in a, in a, in a wheat field, in the dark, in the rain, sometimes it just seemed impossible. The new crop circles start coming every April and we stick the pins in the map exactly where the crop circles are and put numbers on the pins so people can just come in, find out, you know, which crop circles are exactly where they are in the land related to the photographs and um, then go out and experience the phenomena for themselves. We're coming here for over 10 years and we've seen many things in, in those 10 years which uh, cannot be ascribed to natural phenomena. For example, uh, lights floating over the fields, lights falling from the sky. Uh, last year we saw a big floating balls of an aluminium uh, shape, uh, five uh, in total number, floating over the, uh, over the wheat, disappearing into the ground, reappearing later and disappearing into the trees. Uh, we made photo photographs of that, so uh, we think that for a part, uh, part of the, of the crop circles are most likely uh, man-made, but another part is, to our impression, not. You start missing and then it's something right. more special. Right. If it's more than semicircles, that's a real... You know. I mean, on one particular occasion, I was camping somewhere not far from this area, actually. Um, for now, it was horrible, cold, windy, dark, rainy night. I had a sudden urge to look out of my tent and you know, unzipped, looked out, and there's an orange ball of light. Big globe of kind of goldeny, orangey light hanging in the sky, which seemed to be about 30 feet over me. I mean, what the hell was that? You know, I mean, it was anywhere long enough to, just for me to notice and reaffirm that it physically was there, and then blink out, and that's it. Almost as if they want to be seen for some reason. It, it's as if they, it's as if they provide a little bit of proof that something really weird is happening, but not just not quite enough to provide definitive proof for the world. But it's just enough to keep us, keep our attention, as it were. And it was July the 26th, 1990, about four o'clock in the afternoon. I was just basically walking across the downs to look at the crop circle from, from the hill. And I saw this glint out of the corner of my eye. I thought, what's that? And uh, I picked up the camera just automatically and started filming it. 
And there was this bright object which was actually moving across the heads of the crop. And it arced round and then dropped into the crop. And it was glinting and flashing. And then it suddenly moved. And this was all on film. I was filming this. Could people make these formations in the middle of the night with the hours of darkness only about four hours before it gets light without, without getting spotted? If people make them all, then you have to explain why the balls of light. You know, why do people have these experiences? I think the door's open to believe it if you wish that they're all man-made, which is the easy option. The more difficult option is they're not man-made, and it's something else that we don't understand. I mean, uh, I think in my personal belief that most of these formations are real. Mm -hmm. When I see them, I am absolutely amazed by them. What do you think? Well, um, I have a slightly different view. I think that we are also uh, having at the moment, uh, we see a lot of man-made formations, but still, for me, this is not so important because I think there are still genuine crop circles and good ones, you know, nice looking ones and, and big ones. And so I, I have to say, I do not spend too much with the, with the, with the man-made theory. The foundation has been laid for the determination that there is such a thing as a crop circle phenomenon. There is no doubt that humans make crop circles and to some extent very good crop circles. But that doesn't play a role in crop circle research. And not because it looked crooked, but simply it didn't, did not have the feeling of, of what we wanted to do. I investigate the crop circles phenomenon because I believe that there is a connection between crop circles and the UFO phenomenon. I believe that they are messages from an alien intelligence. There are again and again crop circles that contain clear messages. For example, the crop circles of Chil Bolton, which were an unmistakable answer to the message that we sent into outer space via the Arecibo radio telescope in 1974. It was something of a greeting card from the Earth, upon which details about ourselves were given. The decimal system, our solar system, where the message is from, what we look like, our population, information about our composition, our DNA. And in 2001, there was a crop circle that took up this pattern exactly, but transposed and translated it into an answer. So we have the same decimal system, but we have a different DNA composition. There it's in the form of a triple helix, whereas it's a double helix for us. We have a perception of a physical structure of that which gives us the answers. We have a different population, a differently represented solar system, and we also have another form of the unit of communication, which we have expressed as the Arecibo transmitter. It was portrayed as a crop circle that was discovered a year before in the same field. That is a clear and direct message. It's not a question of interpretation, only of translation. I'm very fascinated myself. And a year later, in 2002, this form appeared with a disk which also contained a binary code. These two figures give me the impression that somebody wants to communicate with us. Okay. Well, maybe he's a nutty. He looks pretty weird. <laughs> but um. Maybe but anyway. Can, but listen, we, uh, can we ask you a question? As yeah, well? of course. Like uh, no, in an un, in an unwork related capacity. So I have to hide the microphone. So so what are you going to report uh, this afternoon? I'm just going to report the truth. What people tell me. I'm not really going to have an opinion. I'm going to say I went to the crop circles. I saw them. And then I'll have the voices of the people I've interviewed and the photos we took. And then people can make up their own mind. But uh, we'll tell people where they are. And if they want to come down and see them, they can. Are you going to play in some alien music? And That is uh, not my decision. But I wouldn't be surprised if the theme of X-Files or something was in there. But uh, yeah, obviously this is, you know, in the news. We've got serious things all over the country, all over the world going on. 
this is going to be one of the lighter stories. But what if this is not just some light story, but some very important story for mankind? Well, if that is the case, I'm very proud to have been here. For, 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 for this particular incident and, and I keep a really open mind. If, if my boss tells me to go to a crop circle again, I'll definitely go. I love them. They're fascinating. And I like the people you meet and I like, you know, I like, I just think it's cool. You know, I think anyone would find this stuff cool. What, what do you think a journalist like you could do to, to shift this to a, to a more ser serious level? That's a, that's a loaded question. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think it's hard because, of course, in people's daily lives on a daily basis at the moment, there are so many hard things going on, like the, the credit crunch, for example, in the UK, or the cost of living. And with important things like that, it's hard for people to worry or think about other stuff because there's so much else going on in their life. What do people want? Fundamentally, they want to survive. What does that mean? Please make tomorrow the same as today. The real response is to trivialise the, the phenomenon, to make it go away. Humans are very good at um, looking the other way, like babies. People have always been familiar with fields, especially in rural areas. They knew what it looks like when a deer had run through a field or when the wind had blown sections down. And then patterns apparently appeared again and again, which didn't correspond to those characteristics. And in order to understand them, to describe them, they were turned into a mystery. The public interest has only become aware in the last 30 years, but we can trace the phenomenon much further back. The first documents are from the year 1590 and describe crop circles in the context of witch trials in Lorraine. And above and beyond that, we find descriptions of what we call crop circles today in fairy tales and in the lore of cultures around the world. You can see this already in the example of the mowing devil. It's a leaflet from the year 1678. The story of a poor peasant labourer is told, who demands a higher wage from the rich landowner to harvest a field. The landowner responds that maybe he should let the devil do it, and that night the field was observed to be in what appeared to be flames. It glowed. The next morning, the landowner found his field in the same condition as the devil would have mown it. Circles had been laid. According to the report, every stalk lay so exactly next to the other that it would have taken a human a lifetime, but only a night for the devil. And that's nothing different from what we're doing today. By projecting our wildest imagination of what could be responsible for the circles into them. And the devil of then is, of course, the aliens of today. The brothers Grimm even described crop circle phenomena back then. They were called fairy rings then. Many people camped out on the field, awoke in the night and hoped that something would happen, but were then driven away by heavy thunderstorms and the appearance of lights. And then swans flew down and shed their feathers. This means that the picture they used could possibly correspond to the light phenomenon which we observe today. So you'll see some trees behind us, and then you can walk all along the top of the hill, and you can see well off to the east, to the north, and to the west here. And I think there'll be enough light, your eyes will be adjusted, but you'll see there's no light, which is really great in the Valley of Pusey. There's only one farm light, and so it, it, it's really, it'll be dark, quite dark. The 
How often is anything seen here per night or even per season? A lot. People who do these watches see a lot, but it's always the question, of course, what do they see? There are, of course, people who are constantly saying something, who look exactly at the military training area and then say every night that they've seen flying lights. You have to view that carefully, of course. And have you ever seen anything interesting during a night watch? Yes, in 1994 I saw something. It started to blink in the crop circle, and then everybody, well at least me, and probably others, aimed the binoculars at this light that had blinked in the crop circle. It then just very slowly drew a finger of light there across the field, and in that moment, when the finger of light would have shown what was where it had first blinked, it shot across to the edge of the field, blinked two or three times, and then it was gone. One formation which especially impressed me was a message that everyone in Mexico would have understood. This formation appeared on the 9th of August 2005 and displays the Mayan calendar. It's also called the Tzolkin. It has, among others, a 20-day cycle, which is arranged outside in this figure. On the inside are the four seasons, each with 13 weeks. 20 times 13 makes 260 days, the human gestation period, because the Mayans thought that man didn't orientate himself according to the 365-day cycle, because that is the cycle of the Earth, but instead to his own 260-day cycle as a human. The noteworthiness of the Mayan calendar systems is especially interesting because they don't exhibit an open counting system, instead only a closed one. 20 is the code for individual life, and 13 is the cosmic factor of movement. That means they define their calendrical measurement system in two positions. They always have a calibration point for the beginning, and thereby also always a calibration point for the relevant ending. So 2012 is a big topic. In short, that's when the Mayan calendar ends. Crop circles have also taken up this theme and show the planetary constellation of our solar system around about the 21st of December 2012 in a crop circle here near Avebury Manor in mid-July 2008. A remarkable point ends here, which we are moving to and moving through. And the second stage is actually what we haven't even considered yet, that time is the carrier of information for evolution. In a certain macro structure, we could say that we are moving through a fourth main stage of evolutionary development. Just like every human being progresses through the phases of childhood and youth, we can also understand here why mental development in the evolutionary process has reached this quality and this standard precisely in this greater cycle, in which we now have the finish line. This means that it is fascinating, but nothing extraordinary to people who have come to an understanding, people who understand that reality is multidimensional anyway, when information from another plane copies itself onto our scene.
What I've seen the last 15 years and what has happened to my life is that I see the amount of coincidences stacking up. So I'm just meeting the right people, just the right events happen. It's all the right things at the right time. And bit by bit you, you, you recognize there's no coincidence. There's a great, great structure behind that. And somehow you very carefully led into the right direction in this whole strange world. And these patterns help that do that actually, talk to you inside. I guarantee anybody that comes over here looks at a looks at a number of real formations or a number of formations and learns to make a kind of a distinction. I, I, I could almost guarantee they'll go away. The hard facts with, with regarding this situation are hard facts. You know, they're not sort of flaky claims or you know wishful thinking. There are certain facts which people do need to know. Now realize this formation is pretty close to, to the white horse. Now imagine you would make that yourself. You would actually put it closer to the white horse. It's amazing that it is in this beautiful spot, but still is a little bit away from the white horse, like it's showing respect to it. Even though when I would have made it, I would have made it much closer to the horse. So that's an enigma in itself, actually. And you know, uh, just uh, 24 hours ago, I was in this road thinking about this field because it was so nice, I could see it from there. That would be very nice to have a formation here. It was not here yesterday, it happened overnight. This woman who lives up in the uh, b, b who runs a b, &B out there, yeah. they've, actually, they've actually walked down here, you know, it wasn't here at half past five in the morning, so that's when she was walking through. So this must have been done sometime after at half past five in the morning today. This is my first encounter on a corn circle, and I'm, I'm skeptic, like, you know, but I've got my views now on it. I don't think it was man-made. Through crop circles, the effect would be that people change their way of thinking, that they open themselves to the unknown and the unusual. Most people are pleased by the phenomenon. It's not a dangerous phenomenon, you know. It doesn't radiate any kind of threat, no violence. On the contrary, it's something beautiful. You're outside in nature. It doesn't matter what you do with it, whether you see aliens in it or messages from nature. It's not primarily about that, but simply an invitation to think differently.